excited to be your moderator today. We have a great panel and hope to hit on a lot of important topics about how states and legislators can use criminal justice policy to mitigate the harm of COVID-19. Before we start, I'd like to point out that viewers can submit any questions or comments in the Q&A box on the center of your screen. You're also welcome to use the chat box to talk to each other. Um, we're gonna be reserving time at the end of the webinar for about 15 minutes for questions and answers, but as they relate to what the panelists are saying, I'll try to bring them up throughout the conversation. Okay, let's get started. First, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. We have Ronnie Lampert, who's the Senior Director of the Criminal Justice and Civil Justice Task Force at the American Legislative Exchange Council. Ronnie also previously served on the Senate Judiciary Committee and was a prosecutor in New Orleans, Louisiana. We also have Sheriff Darren Hall, who's been working in Davidson County, Tennessee as the sheriff since 2002 and has been responsible for a large reduction in their incarcerated population. We have John Tilley, who's currently a senior fellow on the Council of Criminal Justice, but also the former secretary of the Kentucky Criminal Justice and Public Safety Cabinet. We have Naomi Smoot Evans, who's the executive director of the Coalition for Juvenile Justice, who she also won kind of numerous awards as a print journalist prior to coming to CJJ. We have Arthur Reiser, who's the Director of Criminal Justice and Civil Liberties at R Street, who also previously served as a federal prosecutor, and Patrick Pline, who works as a policy analyst at the Nolan Center for Justice at the American Conservative Union Foundation. Thanks, everybody, for being on at Sherpal, so you could join as well. <laughs> um, let's get started. Our first question is fairly simple and something a lot of people are talking about. At this point, the CDC has put out that almost a million cases of COVID have been found in the United States and over 57,000 people have already passed away unfortunately from this virus. Meanwhile, correctional facilities in Ohio, New York, and throughout the country are becoming new epicenters for the virus. So how can we halt the spread of COVID-19 within our communities and correctional facilities without harming public safety? John, perhaps you would like to start with this question? Sure, yeah, and I just got off a call with the Council on Criminal Justice where we had two state corrections administrators, uh, directors of large state prison systems, and had a jailer as well uh, from Houston, uh, Sheriff Ed Gonzalez, uh, so the difference in jails and prisons. But I, I, think, I think it's important to, to note the obvious, that, that first of all, follow the CDC's guidelines, as difficult as it is to social distance, especially in jail, but, but also in prison, there are things you can do. I mean, clearly observe the obvious and do those things. Provide soap, hand sanitizer, distance, um, step up healthcare, make certain that folks get proper referrals out for healthcare immediately. You know, test as you can as resources will allow. We know the resources are clearly a, a factor here, but we've seen mass testing in somewhere like Houston, which has produced a number of cases. And then those sometimes are asymptomatic are, are testing positive as we know in the general population as well. So certainly there's an answer there that you can mass test where, where appropriate and where possible, but target test as you know you can. We've seen success in certain state prison systems like Oregon and Missouri we had on today that have used box testing or, or again the target testing to identify those who have tested and then isolate, use cohorts to isolate folks properly uh, to protect them and others because we know that, that right now um, the levels of infection are higher in the incarcerated population, but they are even higher for staff. And so given that staff are coming home to communities, it's even more critical um, that, that we, we, well, it's critical that we care for everyone, but it's more so that we see that link to, to the incarcerated population and communities with those who are being released, and uh, whether they're being released uh, through expedited or early release, or whether they are simply uh, going home at the expiration of their sentence and uh, having to reenter under difficult circumstances. So I know our other panelists have a lot to add to that, but I think it's just important that we observe the obvious right off the bat and get that right, especially during a, a, what is a global pandemic. Sheriff Hall, you're dealing with this right now in the facilities that you oversee. What is that looking like? How are you responding? Yeah, you know, um, I, I think, I think, um, I think there's a word of anxiety for everyone and the inmate population, the staff, management of staff, the public, public at large. And, and I've come to realize that the reason that we're all in that state is that, that the, the answers aren't consistent every day. That's nobody's fault. I'm not blaming people, but because the targets move, wear a mask, don't wear a mask, uh, you know, expose test, mask test. 
it's very hard to get comfortable as a leader and then also kind of uh, confide that in your staff. Families, I was on the phone call this morning with, with some families of inmates uh, calling in, asking some questions. And, and I was telling them, you know, I want to be able to give you much clearer answers about certain things. Uh, for example, we have inmates who have tested positive. And, you know, from the simple person, and I'm not a medical expert, but from a simple person, once you're tested positive, I would assume that once you're symptom-free and three days minus fever and so forth, you'll phase back in the general population. We've had some issues in our jails where people are testing positive a second time from that original test, which delays them being released back into population, which sends signals to family members and so forth and uncertainties. And so uh, I, I don't know how to answer it other than to say, I think the anxiety is not because it's a new road. We've not been down, none of us in, in the world of medical or corrections. And uh, it, it is a difficult thing to, 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 to beg confidence in. And so inmates are nervous, staff are nervous, families are nervous. And uh, uh, it, it, is, it is an uncomfortable thing to lead because I want to be able to give answers. And, um, uh, and I'll tell you the, the circumstances around it. Um, uh, I just heard John talking about the various, uh, you know, we, I've, I've evolved in my own belief about, how we need to test the population because I'm, I'm in a jail system. I used to work in a prison system, but in the jails, because it's such a transient situation, um, you better be prepared to mass test a lot be, if you're going to do mass testing, because you know, this they are coming and going quickly. And, and today's test really doesn't mean a whole lot in a week. And so you just got to get that clear at one time. I think people were thinking mass testing would kind of comfort people. What I have found is it basically just means a snapshot in time. That's where you stood. Uh, you know, 48 hours from now, we could be in a different place. Yeah, that's a great point. And it sounds like being transparent about where correctional agencies are with testing, with cases, with what's being done with family members if they are sick is key to really just, you know, helping incarcerated individuals, but also staff and families who are on the outside and the entire community that they understand that, you know, leaders are doing the best they can, but they're also communicating with them. Um, Naomi, the juvenile system, one thing that's really been focused on there is just reducing the incarcerated population and the detained population as much as possible. I saw earlier this week a Maryland Court of Appeals order from a couple of weeks ago had resulted in a reduction of roughly a third of their detention population. So, they, so they're able to do a little bit more social distancing and be more attuned you know, to testing, et cetera, inside the facilities. What is this looking like in the juvenile system? So I think we're seeing some really great wins on the youth side. Um, we've seen a dramatic reduction in our juvenile detention population over the past 10 years to begin with. So we were already lower than where we were um, this time a decade ago. And there's been a big push in this moment, particularly to make sure that we can get as many young people home as possible. Um, nationally, we're seeing about a 20% reduction in the number of young people who are in facilities currently. And some sites, like you mentioned, 30%. Um, we've seen in Georgia with Judge Steve Teske as much as 70 to 80 percent reduction in placements. And we're really seeing that the only folks who are left in those youth facilities are people who are awaiting hearings on really serious charges. Um, and so my hope is that we come out the other side of this in a place where we have really sort of rethought our youth justice system and use this as a a leverage point where we can really rethink who needs to be in our youth justice facilities specifically um, moving forward. And that gives some room in this moment for, for those social distancing measures that aren't able to be taking place in overcrowded facilities, right? Um, it also, with reduced populations, makes testing a little bit more feasible. Um, there are some jurisdictions that are doing a really good job of reporting out um, so that families back home know what the numbers are. There are other jurisdictions that are struggling to get testing. Um, and so that puts those families in a, in a different position in terms of knowing what may be going on. But nationally, we're seeing um, a large number of facility staff, particularly in youth facilities that are contracting the virus. Um, fewer youth, but we are seeing some outbreaks starting on that side as well. Um, so again, just to the earlier points around to the extent that we can, um, having those social distancing practices in place, having personal protective equipment in place, having testing, um, all of those things, because young people particularly, um, you know, if they know that telling someone that they're not feeling well is going to result in them having to be by themselves in a cell for a long time, 
they're not going to tell us, right? They're not going to put themselves in a situation um, where they're put in isolation. And so we're seeing some other um, great recommendations as well coming out from folks around how to make sure that social distancing doesn't inadvertently result um, in isolation. Thank you. Patrick, what is your take on this issue? How do, we, how do we do this in a holistic manner for both kids and adults and with the public safety in mind still? Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the big point that everyone's really hit on, and I think it's, it's one that really stands for everyone is, is, look, this is a global pandemic. It doesn't discriminate against anybody. And we've seen that this is something where we need all communities to join together to, you know, abide by these CDC guidelines, the social distancing, the increased hygiene. We need everybody to do that to, you know, so-called flatten the curve. This doesn't stop at prison, within prison walls and within jails. Um, we have, you know, obviously a lot of people mentioned the staff, um, and I, you know, that's a critical piece. We have staff who are going in and out every single day, um, and those staff who are coming back to their family, their kids, they're grocery shopping, they're walking their dogs, they're doing the same thing every, everybody else is doing. And if they can't adhere by, you know, the same guidelines that everybody else is, they're at risk and they're putting other people at risk. So I think, you know, the big piece is just making sure, and you know, obviously the being able to do this in a way that doesn't lead to just putting everybody in in isolation is you know the key point that doesn't make us any safer either um and you know the way we've kind of looked at it is there are a lot of people in prison right now who don't need to be there and actually right now where they are is probably more dangerous than what's going to be happening on the outside i mean we don't need a guy who cheated his taxes to be susceptible to a death sentence we don't need a kid who was selling dime bags on the corner to now you know be what was, you know, two, three, four, five year, 10 year sentence can now turn into a death sentence. That is just not something that can be happening. And I think we need to, you know, obviously make sure that these people, wherever they are, are able to adhere by these guidelines to stay healthy and safe themselves. Yeah, that's a great segue. Uh, another thing that people are talking about, even whether you're releasing people and they're now in the community, um, and they obviously in the past, like there'd be a very big focus on making sure that they're getting the community supervision and other services that are helpful towards act actually ensuring a successful reentry and not um, ensuring they don't return back to the correctional system. Or it's people that are still incarcerated, but maybe because of social distancing requirements or just the overall um, pressure on facilities to focus on this public health crisis they're not able to maybe take as much time to have the rehabilitation programming, um, you know, might be difficulties in even establishing virtual connections to treatment providers or ensuring medication and other things are given to people before they're released. How do we still promote smooth reentry and rehabilitation during a pandemic? And what is this teaching us about the future and how to better build this infrastructure? Wow. So I haven't talked, so I'm assuming you're asking me that question. Um, and I just want to point out that Patrick looks like he has a fresh haircut. Um, and I'm very oh. suspicious nope, I just how that know. happened when we're supposed to be socially distancing. Um, so, you know, listen, I think this is an excellent question because it is really easy to talk about reentry uh, when you have a 3% unemployment rate. Uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, Ronnie and I were just on another com a call right before this where, you know, we, they brought up the fact that when it gets to 15%, which is what unemployment is right now, that is a much different conversation to have uh, about reentry. But it's still just as important because we know that reentry, rehabilitation, and uh, incarceration rates and crime uh, in general revolve around the idea of people being gainfully employed. Um, it's one of the number one determining factors uh, for individuals to be reunited with society is to have the ability to provide for their family. So I think the conversation has it, it, changed a little bit and we have to be very careful about how we address this. So a couple of things that um, I, I would like to kind of add on to what other people said that's in the lens of uh, rehabilitation and reentry is we need to redefine what public safety means. Um, you know, Patrick's organization, you know, has always been kind of championing the idea that, and I agree with that, you have to talk about public safety first. It really has to be the tip of the spear because it's very hard to bring anybody along with you. And I totally agree with that. But what public safety means in the, the shadow of COVID has to mean something different. Um, and I think it, it's people like you know us, honestly, and legislators, which is what this, this webinar is about, have to start deciding um, what that means. I, I, I agree that we, we don't have to have a criminal justice response to everything right now. I think that, you know, sure, um, if somebody's a tax evader, they definitely need to be punished, but this is not the time to put those kind of people um, in jail. And it's, you know, 
for years, the communities of color have been saying the last thing they want is more interaction with police. And now police are saying the exact same thing. The last thing that the police officers want is to have more interaction with individuals that they don't need to. So I think all these things are kind of colliding together um, in this perfect storm, if you will, uh, where we we have to kind of face, you know, this, this quite honest, this addiction that we've had with incarceration in the United States over the last 40 years. Um, and I'm actually, you know, Think there's a lot, a lot of things to be that are promising. I mean, look, Ohio is is really engaging hard on getting their individual tested um, and trying to ensure that um, they're they're keeping individuals as safe as possible because they're people um, first and foremost, regardless of they're incarcerated or not. And you know, it's just some numbers come out of Ohio. Is I just, I've just been reading about it, so I'll use that as my example. You know, you know, Patrick just talked about how these individuals go home. If you're, if you're a, a correctional officer, you go home at the end of the day. Prisons are not vaults. Um, you know, it isn't something sealed in. You know, what, what's bad does not stay in there. People come in and out of prisons all the time. And I think that in a great example, if you look at where uh, Marion um, uh, Prison, in, which is in the city of Marion, has the exact same infection rate as Cleveland. Even though it's a, it's a city that has, it's very, uh, the population is very little. Why? Because the vast majority of people that live in that community are people who work in the prison, and that prison has an incredibly high infection rate. So when it comes to rehabilitation and reentry, to kind of circle back to your question, one, you can't rehabilitate someone who's dead, period. Um, I stole that line from Daryl Atkins. I'm just going to give him credit. But you cannot rehabilitate someone who's dead. So we really need to be thinking about uh, you know, survival of these people who while you know they're incarcerated and, and they've committed um, crimes, they, they didn't commit a crime worthy of a death sentence. Um, and the, the other thing that I would say is, I think we need to really re-examine what public safety means, and we have to have policy um, that aligns with this new definition. Well, Emily, I haven't talked either, so I'm assuming you were asking me as well uh, to borrow Go for it. Arthur. Um, so I, Arthur has kind of gave a, um, good broad introduction of what prisons and jails could do uh, specifically and what we can do really around the issue of reentry. But um, I have a few ideas or policy solutions, if you will. One is, you know, this whole concept of contact with family members. You know, I think one thing we haven't heard about very much is the fact that you have family members uh, of individuals who are now being not able to visit their members who are incarcerated. So what some states have actually done is they've increased the amount of time that inmates can, can conduct their visit or contact their members via phone or video. Um, so, and these states have included Missouri, Utah, and there have been a few others as well that have actually permitted these uh, people who are incarcerated to have more time to contact their family members because that is crucial to a successful reentry for people to maintain contact with their family members. That is absolutely crucial. It gives individuals hope. It gives individuals a, a tie to the community, if you will. Um, another uh, method to kind of continue reentry programs is, look, I mean, this is a webinar. We're all here hearing us speak about this topic. I mean, use technology and other tools to conduct reentry programs and also religious services as well. Um, this is, you know, of course, subject to uh, the CDC's guidelines, provided that this can be done as long as there's adequate social distancing, you know, people maintaining six feet apart. But if this is being done during video or audio sessions, this could be absolutely uh, crucial to ensuring that someone continues the success. Someone may have been on a very successful path and may have done very well with their reentry programs and their educational programs, job training, what have you. And now that's kind of been turned upside down, but that doesn't mean that the progress should necessarily stop. So in, in, at, at ALEC, we actually have a model on in support of reentry programs, which recognizes the importance of these programs and the role that they play in reducing recidivism rates. Because like Arthur said, Patrick, always, Patrick and his organization always point to, it starts with public safety first. And reducing and sound reentry programs reduce recidivism rates, which positively contribute to public safety. Um, so um, thank you for, again for putting to get this panel together, and I'm looking forward to further discussion. I'm glad you brought that up, Ronnie. A, a lot of uh, local sheriffs and, and uh, jail administrators have worked to do that as well as state correctional agencies, really furthering those family connections. 
Um, what about for you know kids or adults who have been released as part of the COVID response measures? What does community supervision look like for them during a pandemic? Um, Naomi, could you speak to that in the juvenile system? And then Sheriff Hall, I'd love to hear your thoughts around that as well. Sure, I think one of the most interesting things that we have in this moment um, is we're all relying more on technology, right? And we often talk about the fact that young people are more adept at technology. And so we have the potential to come out the other side of this with a system, particularly a youth system, that works for youth in a way that the existing and previous system just didn't, right? Um, what we're seeing is a lot of probation departments, a lot of community-based programming, mentoring, moving to online platforms, moving to app-based interactions. Um, the challenge with that, though, is that a lot of the things that make web-based interaction possible are challenges for a lot of folks, right? In rural communities, broadband access isn't there and is a serious challenge. Um, not everyone has access to apps and tablets and computers and all of those things that it takes to make this possible. Um, so to the extent that funders and other folks, um, government agencies that have funding available um, can help with that and make sure that everyone has access to those tools. That's gonna be key to making sure that young people can stay on track. Um, I think one of the other things that we're seeing that's really interesting is a move towards helping make sure that mental health care and health care conti can continue, um, again, using technology, right? Um, but that requires that all folks have access to that. Um, education, moving to web-based platforms, it's really a, a technologically based society that we're at in this moment. Um, one of the other things that we're seeing, particularly for youth, um, much like when computers first went into schools and we learned and libraries and we learned that we needed to put some filters on so that not all the websites are accessible. Um, we're learning quickly that when we give a kid a tablet to use for probation, um, we need to make sure there's filters on there um, so that they're not tempted to do something that would violate their probation with that tablet that we just gave them. That's a great point. And speaking to the tablets really quickly, um, for you know, in jail systems like New Orleans, some of uh, they're actually working to install Wi-Fi in different living units instead of even just the educational spaces. So that way, when if they have the technology, they're able to you know use that while still being socially distanced. I know Pierce County Probation is exper experimenting with an app that probation officers can use to contact kids and direct them to services. So there's definitely, hopefully, I mean, people in technology industries also will be really offering themselves as a resource to innovate in this space. Um, Sheriff Hall. Yeah, it's kind of funny. It's, it's really pretty good timing for this, but um, we have some 100 or so out of a thousand uh, inmates in our jail system today. They're on some form of restriction COVID related. So what that really means in our system is you're either a high risk exposed case, meaning someone close to you has been tested or tested positive or the results of your test aren't back or you're symptomatic or you're positive. But in all of those cases, you're isolated individually uh, until we get all these results back. And of course, that's at the direction of our medical uh, provider. But here, here's, here's the interesting thing that you're talking about. Um, our facility, brand new uh, uh, detention center and all of our facilities has the typical jail phone systems out on the wall. You would go and you can call and use the systems or whatever. So what, what I did two years ago was I rolled out tablets to every inmate. This is before. So every inmate in our system had tablets. We've had some, some bumps about that. It's just been hard to really facilitate. The technology wasn't up this far. We also had some other, other issues on our side. We got better at it. But the truth is we were waiting to open our new facility. We'll come to find out this COVID thing arrives. We had to open our facility earlier. It has a much better medical facility and separation opportunities for people who need to be medically isolated. So that all sounded really, really good. We're excited about it because it gives us a better chance to manage their health crisis while not disrupting and having to, quite frankly, lock everybody else down because they were being exposed to these individuals. So when we did that, everything felt really good. We thought we were doing a pretty good job, except our phone access to the families that you guys have mentioned several times required the person to leave their cell, walk out into the day room areas, of course, and go use the phones and this and that, which would be fine on a normal operation. The problem now is medical and others don't want the interaction between the other inmates, our staff, medical, healthcare, whatever, or excuse me, food service, all the different things. So 
So I, I got in touch with our provider and said, look, we, we need you to do this two weeks ago. So this yesterday morning, we distributed 121 tablets inside of the isolation units. Uh, these are just medical facilities is what, what, really what it is. So everybody that is now in any form of COVID restriction has a tablet inside. All the other inmates have their tablets. Um, but to be honest with you, for the last couple of weeks, that population hasn't been able to stay connected to the family that we, we all have just mentioned and how important that is, not only for reentry, quite frankly, but it's also for reducing the tension of people who are incarcerated. I mean, we're managing a population. We want them to have an ongoing relationship with family for the, for the reentry, but also to just live a normal life while we're in this situation. So, so that's really helped us. The use of the tablet world that we've been trying to push out, and, and now we're, we're doing that on a, on a really as-needed, right-this-minute basis. But it's, um, it, it is true that jails and prisons remind me of churches a little bit, that oftentimes the people who make decisions about them are way too old, uh, I'm old, by the way, um, to be deciding what age we're really targeting to try to get to come to church or synagogue or whatever, you should ask people who are that age. I have a 26 year old and an 18 year old. That age is much more likely to come to jail than my age. So the truth is what we need is technology that that age is comfortable with using, needs to stay connected with their families and so forth. And, and so what, what I'm trying to do, we have been, is trying to move the technology to the age of targeted in a jail, a little different than prison, uh, so they're comfortable in using it. Upon arrival, every inmate will have a tablet to, to really conduct every part of their business. My dream of that one day is that their information that they may would eventually go to a cloud and when they get out, connect them back. Well, that's theirs forever. What they download and what they buy, what they want, what they need, what they learn. Right now, it's not able to be done the way I'd love. I'd love to see that become a part of who they are. And who knows, one day when you come to jail, that would be brought back to you. And when you leave, you continue it in follow-up care, mental health, treatment, reentry, whatever. But um Technology is, to me, very important, not only because of COVID, but because of the population that we're talking about coming and going from jail systems don't write a lot of letters anymore. I mean, they're, they're doing uh, use of technology that we need to provide for them. Yeah, thank you. One of our um, viewers flagged that she's been, uh, she has a loved one in prison right now, and she's been writing to the Ohio governor to start working on in, in integrating JPay and other things on the tablets and technology in there so that way they can communicate more frequently. So, I mean, Davidson County is surely at the head of this. Um, hopefully other local and uh, state uh, agencies are also considering working on this as well. Um, I'll flag this slightly, but there's a risk of over-criminalization with some of the public health restrictions um, that have been put in place. Obviously, this is a very delicate delicate topic. I mean, you want to make sure that people are um, making choices that don't put others at risk of harm, but also balance that with the impact. We know that incarceration is, is having the further harm it could have on actually amplifying um, the spread of the virus. Ronnie, I'm, I'm curious to hear how your take on how do we promote public health without over-criminalizing behavior? Well, it's, it's a delicate balance uh, for sure. I mean, these are extraordinary times. And, uh, there's this balance between public, public, promoting public health without over-criminalizing behavior. And right now, law enforcement agencies uh, should really especially be using their resources in the most efficient and effective manner. So, and, and as many of you are aware, many of these executive orders allow for uh, fine, arrest, or potentially imprisonment. In fact, Virginia's shelter-in-place order allows for a sentence of up to 12 months in jail. I mean, that's a year. Uh, DC's provides for a fine of five thousand dollars. I mean, with rising unemployment rates, fines such as these are very, very difficult for individuals to pay. And, and ultimately, look, I mean, governments should shy away from arresting individuals for merely violating the stay-at-home order for a number of reasons. I mean, first, you know, warnings can often be sufficient um, to have people disperse or go elsewhere. Um, and also, practically speaking, arresting people increases the risk of the spread of the virus because the law enforcement officers come into contact with the arrestee. That individual gets sent to a jail facility. And if that individual is positive or if individuals in the jail are, are positive for the coronavirus, then they could spread that upon their release or within the jail facility itself, depending on where they go. 
So th this would really cause significant strain if you know, it, it spread through the law enforcement ranks to a, sy a system that's very much overburdened already. Uh, and you know, really, especially also the fine fees piece, especially in light of the economic downturn, individuals should be burdened with high court fines or fees. Um, and, and Alec has a model on uh, fines and fees and it says that individuals should, who should, an individual's ability to pay should be taken into account and if they are assigned with a high fine or fee or any kind of fine or fee. But ultimately, this, you know, as far as the overcriminalization piece, this is a, it's, it's a delicate balance. Um, you've seen the stories of, you know, the individual in Colorado who was arrested for playing with his family in a park. Um, some, some people say, well, they're violating the park was closed or the beaches were closed in California. And, you know, who, you know, we, this, it's necessary, this, that, and the other. I mean, who's really upset? Uh, Brian Wilson, Mike Love, and the rest of the Beach Boys. But, I mean, really, look at this practically and say that there is a delicate balance and at some point you can't just shut down beaches and public places in perpetuity uh, right now this is an emergency and this is necessary but ultimately arrest should be used as a last resort or any kind of fine or fee I mean, this is these are really unprecedented times and a lot of people are hurting and they don't really need extra fines and fees or extra obligations when they're already struggling to meet their bottom line and if I could just follow up on that real quick, because I think, I mean, that hits the nail on the head. And especially, you know, the way we look at things is it is a very delicate balance. You don't want to sit there slapping fines on people that they're not going to be able to pay. Um, but at the same time, if our solution to people not social distancing is to send a couple officers to go grab them and bring them into a jail facility that they obviously cannot social distance in, it seems like we're just counterintuitive. I mean, everything we're doing there is counterintuitive. Obviously, there's some folks that need to be removed from the community. But somebody that, you know, mom letting her kids play on a playground doesn't need to be exposed to that. That's just not really furthering what we need. Emily, I would, Emily, oh, yeah, let, let me just extend that to um, lesser offenses as well. I think we would all agree whether it be there's certain misdemeanors, we could all agree a, a citation could be issued in lieu of arrest. I'd, I'll take you back to a time I sponsored some legislation roughly a decade ago, which, which it undertook that philosophy within the first year of identifying a number of misdemeanors which required a citation in lieu of arrest. We had roughly 18 or 19,000 fewer arrests in the first year, and our public safety factor was not harmed. In other words, things didn't get more dangerous. Public safety was not harmed in any way, and failures to appear didn't go up. People actually came to court, were held accountable for whatever offense they committed, but with a citation. I would certainly agree with Ronnie and Patrick as well. We don't need to overburden folks with fines and fees, but to the extent it's appropriate, we can use that as an accountability measure if there's a hard case in which someone simply will not abide by a law, a law enforcement officer's reasonable instruction to disperse or whatever. So I think that has to be used in some sense, but certainly as a last resort, a last resort arrest would be appropriate. Again, and we've seen the sky hasn't fallen when we've used these measures uh, outside of a pandemic and they could be used within them as well. And I think this is a lesson learned moving forward as well. Thank you, John. Arthur, something you've talked about is how arresting for some of these low level offenses during a pandemic when things are in crisis can really affect law enforcement relationships with community um, communities and per potentially on the opposite side, if law enforcement are really out there working with communities, helping to support their needs rather than focusing maybe on some of these other matters, might be an opportunity to restore legitimacy. Yeah, I think that that's actually an excellent point, but I'm going to answer that second. Uh, before I, I get there, I want to talk, kind of go back a step about, you know, you talk about community supervision. One of the easiest things we can do to help with the, the community supervision system right now is, you know, really think about technical violations. And if we are gonna have some type of violation, it should be graduated. Um, I think that is something that is uh, a, kind of a no brainer. So I'll put that on the table. I also wanna give a shout out to um, one of the comments in the, the chat. Um, it, you can go to the chat and look um, at fourthpurpose.org. Um, they're starting a, uh, a visitation 2.0 um, um, policy program where they're really analyzing how visitation can look um, in this new world. And I, I you know, I, I know Josh, uh, who runs Fourth Purpose, it is an exceptional organization. They do exceptional work. So I encourage you all to, to check it out. Um, but 
as regards to your policing um, question, and I would love to hear uh, Sheriff Hall's um, uh, perspective on this as well. For a long time, we've been hearing about this war on police, um, and you know we can have different opinions. On, on what the reality of that is. I mean, sure, is there other certain op other officers that feel that they, they, they don't get the respect they deserve? Yeah, absolutely. Is some of that deserved? Probably. Um, but regardless of that, there is a trust gap between the communities um, and the police force in many cities, uh, you know, especially communities of color. And this really is an opportunity for police to, you know, come back to the table and really uh, project themselves as servants of the people. And I really think that the, the, the police departments that are doing um, this in the best way, LAPD is one of them that I'll give a shout out to, is they're, 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 they're really ramping up their community-oriented policing uh, programs during these hard times. I think they're gonna come out of this um, smelling like roses because you know we really turn to our cops when we need them. We need cops right now. They need to be protected too. First and foremost, we need to protect our police officers to ensure they don't get sick. Um, and then after that, uh, we need to ensure that we're not asking officers to do stupid things that can get them sick. Um, let's not have them enforcing um, policies that you know can lead to them being infected. Um, so I think that this is an, actually a great opportunity for police across the country. They really can look like the guardians that they are, the heroes they are. And I'll just point out that nobody was talking about a war on police, you know, on September. Um, uh, 12, 2001, um, you know, people turned to the police and they love police uh, because they needed police and they saw that. So I'll, I'll uh, not to be overly cheesy there, but um, I'll put that on the table. I think, and just to add what's already been, to what's already been shared, but I think the interesting thing in this moment is um, much like what we've seen on the juvenile justice side, where we reduced incarceration, but public safety wasn't put in jeopardy as a result of it, right? We're not policing communities as, as heavily in this moment as we typically have. Um, and there's been no noticeable spike in crime rates across the country, right? We're seeing reductions actually in terms of the number of young people specifically who are being referred to courts. And that's phenomenal because often these low level behaviors that we police on impact young people the most, right? Curfew violations, things like that. Um, I talked with one jurisdiction early on that still had some young people in facilities for skipping school, even though school in that, that jurisdiction had been closed. And so I think what we're seeing now is a reverse of that trend and really embracing the fact that maybe we don't need uh, to be as vigilant and maybe that keeps both our law enforcement officers safe and our community safer um, as well at the same time. Yeah, Emily, I don't know. Is it okay? I was going to mention a couple pieces, and I and I, I don't disagree. I think I think everything was pretty much the um, I think accurate. I would be real careful to analyze what's going on right now for all of us. And I, I'm looking at. I, I, I wish I could. I give you a good example. Uh, I I went to our city police chief and 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 our city let's just say the criminal justice leaders six weeks ago on the very front end of this and said, hey, look, we've been working on bail reform. We've been working on the last three or four years. We've been working to try to drive our population down for reasons that have nothing to do with the healthcare crisis. But so that we've been lucky because that had started back then and we've, we've reduced our population, uh, I thought, before, the, before this COVID thing. Once COVID came, it gave us a different reason to say, hey, wait a minute, Let, you know, let's talk about who needs to be in jail versus who needs to be awaiting trial at home which is hard to get people to think about before COVID, quite frankly. And um, here, here's something you may not hear everywhere. I, I think the police, the term police, the arrest is getting way too much attention in this situation. Here's what I'm talking about. The danger to making the arrest is really not to that officer. I mean, I, look, that, there are dangerous jobs in the world and police making an arrest out in the streets of, of a city or a town for issues like weapons and God knows what else, you know, sure, that's real. We, we see it, we know it, we all would agree there is a risk out there. But to be honest with you, the arresting person isn't who's really most likely to be exposed if that arrested individual turns out to have a healthcare dilemma, let's call it uh, this COVID thing. What you're really doing is you're putting that person in an environment, right, a jail, forget the arrest, the car driving down there can be clean, pretty simple, pretty, but when you're housing a person two and three and four days, a wedding go to trial, taking them to a courtroom, coming back and forth, 
you're exposing that individual to a lot of things that they wouldn't have been had you not made the arrest. You're also exposing all the, the correctional staff. The term, I, I, I don't believe the correctional side ever gets the attention that it deserves. And what I really mean by that is they're quasi healthcare people right now. And they're really the most at risk. And I'm talking about of a government employee other than a nurse. Let's get, to, get that out of the way. But I think the word police gets way too much attention in this situation. I, we can debate all day. I don't disagree with a lot of the stuff, the crime rates and all that. But when you're talking about COVID, the person who we as a government are really putting at risk is this person you never really get to know that is really the correctional face out in the back of these jails that you're asking them to detain people that quite frankly don't always need to be detained. And we, we literally, and, and my chief of police, I told him, I went to him, I said, let me tell you something. You're arresting a person every time you do that. I want you to ask yourself, will your officer stay with us tonight when you put him in jail? Do you want him in jail so bad you would live with him? Because you're asking someone else to live with that individual. And I'm talking about, can't we await court? Can't we just cite the individual? I mean, and I'll give you numbers, real life numbers. We would arrest 100 people a day in Nashville, Tennessee. Yesterday, we arrested 24. That number hasn't moved much. We've gone from 100 to 24 people. And, and by the way, that's 90% felony arrest. Almost every misdemeanor are all cited now. Credit to them. That's the police side. The point is, it, it's forcing us to ask the questions while awaiting a citation, while awaiting a court date. Let's see if the crime rate to go up or down. I don't believe they'd get, they go up. People await trial. They have a better chance in court when they're out of jail. They have a better situation around them. And so in some weird ways, it might allow us to prove that people awaiting courts is really should be done from home. I mean, jails are full of people awaiting trial because they don't have money. Well, now we're being able to use something other than the money conversation to get those individuals out. And my hope is the evidence would prove society wasn't put at any safety risk because they were awaiting trial at home. And uh, so I, I would just, I, I think deep down, our, our question needs to be, who are we asking to perform the task? And it's, it's the, by the way, Police officers make a lot more money than the person who's living in the jail today in every community. And so you're asking a very low level paid position oftentimes in government, a correctional officer, which I think are, are heroes in their own way, just because they're, they're not arresting people. And then they're asked to deal with the, not only the, the danger associated, now this, this medical condition. So, so I say that because the police get way too much attention, in my opinion, and I'm talking about the front line of the risk of the exposure. The risk of the exposure is after you put them in a facility and all of those people living with them who, um, you know, again, I think we, we have overused corrections, overused jails for years. Uh, and now you're asking them to perform a health care. We've always been a mental health care facility, unfortunately, you know, that, that, that we need to deal with what, what, what's going on. And I think, Sheriff Hall, that's a perfect segue to our last main question. Um, and I'd be curious to hear kind of a short bit from each of the panelists. As we respond to this crisis, how can states, how can legislators help build a policy infrastructure that will help us better promote both public health and public safety in a future pandemic and in just life after COVID? What does that practically look like? I'm happy to I'm happy to start in with Emily. I've, I've again I've, I've served I think in all three branches in that regard, and I think it it's incumbent upon all three branches to begin to do this. But let's look at what a legislature can do. Uh, first of all, I think I think many states have have uh, done this, have engaged in common sense criminal justice reform. I think we are all advocates for that. They can continue those reforms. Much more is needed in most states, as we can clearly see, whether it be front end pretrial bail reform, which the sheriff touched on. Let's, let's get those who can safely await trial out. Let's not make money the determining factor to incarcerate someone, especially pretrial. Inability to pay should not be the crime. I think we need to rethink how we criminalize and often over-criminalize substance use disorder, mental illness, and poverty. Uh, and I think we've, we've touched on that as well. I think we have to tackle when appropriate um, sentence length in the country so that we are not keeping folks longer past the point of a return, past the point of protecting public safety, then it becomes simply retribution. And I think we have to look on the back end, and we've touched on this, many of us on the call have looked at how we focus on reentry and lowering recidivism, which at its core is good public safety. And I think we have done a good job, but there's so much more to do. I think it's so resource dependent 
uh, that when you look initially at finding someone a job, which right now is nearly impossible for those reentering with 26 plus million people out of work, it's not realistic to think, as Arthur touched on, that you could find someone reentering from a, a facility a job, but you can find them housing. You can help with transportation. You can help connect them with critical services, especially if they're ill. And that's, that's again, that could be treatment, that could be mental health, it could be treatment for their addiction, but it certainly could be, again, just that link to the community, uh, that warm handoff that we all talk about, but so often don't absolutely get right. And so I think policies can absolutely be put in place from whether it be a justice reinvestment philosophy, which a number of, number of us would advocate, or just the, some good old fashioned common sense reform. And I think at the end of the day, if we distinguish who we're mad at and who we're afraid of, as we've said before, I think we'll get there. Thank you, John. Yeah, and if I may just uh, briefly, one of the areas that you know could really be addressed and one of, that's really been highlighted with this pandemic is look, this, this pandemic is eventually going to pass at some point and perhaps we can take some lessons from this pandemic about what sound policy worked in the pandemic. Uh, and I think one of the areas is occupational licensing. So you're seeing a lot of gubernatorial executive orders that are suspending uh, licensing requirements if the person has a reciprocal, reciprocal license in another state. And an example of that is Governor Doug Burgum in uh, North Dakota did that. And he, what he did was he essentially issued an executive order that had already been codified in one state, and that state was Arizona last year. Governor Ducey signed a bill allowing for reciprocal licenses. And um, it's just, I mean, it not only makes sense for the pandemic, especially with, for medical professionals, but it also makes sense for individuals who are getting out of prison. As John pointed out, and unemployment rates are, are very high right now, but ultimately with occupational licensing reform, eventually the economy is going to come back and people are going to be able to seek certain jobs. And I can tell you right now, my hair is the longest it's ever been. And in some states, you need a license to be a barber. And I can tell you, once this pandemic's over, the first place I'm probably going to go is a barber shop. So for those we'll states- Patrick's house, because apparently he has access to a barber. Yeah. Patrick, maybe I'll borrow your clippers or something like that, or whatever it is that you're, whoever your barber is making house calls or, or I don't know. But it's, um, it's definitely an area that merits consideration and I would hope states look at that going forward and see how important it is not only for individuals with the criminal record, but also society generally in response to an emergency. And if I could add kind of one more piece, I want to just go on the record echoing and agreeing with Secretary Tilly and Ronnie. I think, you know, that's obviously a perfect you know, solution. I think another thing that we really need to look at and something that got mentioned earlier was, you know, the folks who have been out with a record that have had a job, had been successful, were on the, the right path and, you know, to no fault of their own are now, you know, back to square zero. And I think, you know, the worst thing that we can do, the worst thing legislators can do, worst thing, you know, for the economy is to now create and, and make these folks a second class of citizen looking to get back in the economy. Because, you know, as, as we all know, if you can't provide for your family, you're going to find a way. Um, and if you're shut out of the legitimate economy, you're going to find that way. And that way is probably not going to be something we like. Um, so, you know, I think policy, second chance policies, um, expungement, things that, you know, allow you to shield your record from the public after a certain period of time where law enforcement still has access to it. Um, you know, it's not, it's never going to go totally away, but just so you can help, you know, get your foot in the door to, you know, have a job as, because as we know, and as people have, have noted multiple times, you know, having a job is one of the the key indicators to make sure that you stay on the straight and narrow and you stay out of prison. So I think, you know, second chance policies will be a big thing coming out of this to make sure that, you know, we have a, a level playing field for people coming out of prison um, and people looking to participate in the economy. And I, I got my hair cut before quarantine. So I just want to get that on the record to make sure I don't have anybody knocking on my door. Yeah, Emily, I think that, you know, there's so many things I want to say. So I'm going to go quickly and, and, and cut it uh, as short as I can. I think what the first thing I think we should learn um, good ideas. I mean, good ideas are good ideas. I, you know, a, a couple of sources that I can put out there is the, the Council for Criminal Justice had done two panels that I've I have watched. One um, was on you know leaders from you know different municipalities talking about how they're dealing with it, real life pragmatic solutions, which I thought was great. The other one was actually uh, moderated by uh, our very own uh, Secretary John Tilley about how the courts are dealing with this, and I 
personally learn a lot about that. There's also, this is not an American problem. This is an international problem. I think reaching out to our, our, our friends across the ocean um, and, and uh, on you know, the, the continent below us and around the world are really important. I mean, on this, uh, this webinar right now, we have an administrator from Hamburg Prisons that is um, um, watching and we're talking to him about what kind of ideas can we put forward that Germany has learned because Germany was you know, ahead of us on this. There's a federal judge from Brazil. I'm sure that he is facing tremendous um, um, uh, you know, pressure and um, uh, just problems when it comes to COVID in, in his own country. So learning from what other people are doing, I think is really important. I think um, the last thing I'll say is we got to keep marching forward um, with our good ideas and we cannot allow this um, this pandemic to, to set us back, you know, so, you know, some issues that, you know, certificates of rehabilitation, um, that, that is not a bad idea now um, that, you know, COVID is here. Pell reinstatement is not, not a bad idea uh, now that COVID is here. Clean slates um, is not a bad idea. I mean, I don't want to um, throw Washington under the bus, but I was disheartened that the governor vetoed the clean slate bill in Washington saying that it's not COVID um, directly related. Yes, it is. These people are going to need work. Um, our economy is going to be struggling. Getting people, you know, fully into the job market is critical. Yes, it is COVID um, impacted. So, and, and lastly, you know, states are going to have you know, start really tightening the belt um, because of uh, just you know tax revenue is dry, uh, drying up. I think we should learn from what Texas did. I mean, the, the whole bug of criminal justice um, started in Texas with them trying to save money. I think those truths are still relevant today. Um, and so I think we should learn from our mistakes, keep marching forward and learn from um, the really smart people that are around us um, to come up with the best policy solutions. Thank you, Arthur. Naomi, do you wanna? <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say that I think that, you know, we've seen on the juvenile justice side, especially that reducing incarceration numbers, doing community based programming, it improves kids lives in the long run and it saves states money. Um, and I think that's going to be critical going forward. I think one of the other things um, that I would add is just making sure that we use the lessons that we're learning in this moment and turn them into permanent policy when appropriate, right? If there are things that are working for our communities, um, this is a great opportunity to transition those things into long lasting lessons. Um, and lastly, I think one of the things that we've seen traditionally on the juvenile justice side and on the criminal justice side is that policy reform often isn't created in an equitable fashion. Um, it, often when we see reductions in incarceration, we see reductions in incarceration of white kids and not of kids of color at the same rates. Um, and so taking this moment to think through um, equity and making sure that any changes we're making are being done in an equitable fashion. And I apologize, but I'm gonna have to hop off in just a second because I have another webinar that I'm doing um, right after this one, busy times. Um, but thank you again for letting so me popular. part of this. <laughs> Thank you, Naomi. Share it all. Yeah, that's. I've often said I think this is more busy. Some of the stuff doing it from home and office than, than it was before. But uh, yeah, you know, um, th this is kind of a weird comment. I, I, I've never really felt this way un until the last few weeks, and I've been in this all my life, thirty years and everything else. But but I, I would, you know, and, and I'm in a state. I'm in Tennessee. I'm in a state. Um, that's not an expansion state for healthcare. And, and I have honestly struggled with this question. There are people today that are in the system that I, I'm involved with, that if we let them go right now, which I have been pushing for weeks and weeks and weeks and trying to get all this, and that's the right thing to do for this conversation. But there's another thing that I think our community, and let me just talk about mine, but I think it's our country. I mean, these people are uninsured, most of them, and are gonna now, be faced with medical challenges, potential, let's call it COVID. And because we haven't addressed that in, in my community and, and quite frankly, in, in our country in some ways, I struggle with what are we doing for them other than, I mean, I, I've, I've said this to my son that uh, he's 18, he's living here, that, that you know, this is what you should understand that when people who are taken off the streets and putting jails and prisons, that they're, they're restricted in everything they, they do. He has never been in jail or prison. I hope he never goes. But the reality of it is, we're taking away your ability to do all these things that he wants to do in life. You need to learn that as a young person because maybe that's not the only way to solve our problems. 
here's my here's my dilemma. The people who need testing and and follow up and and ventilators and healthcare and all that are oftentimes uh, in my community uninsured. If we release them, which we're working hard to do, and they so happen to have these symptoms and they're homeless and they're in, their their ability to get access to healthcare to fix that or help them is extremely long. The shot long shot. It doesn't mean they need to be incarcerated, but what it may mean is that society needs to look at really what this is, is a healthcare crisis, that we're using criminal justice to kind of sweep the streets to accomplish it. And I don't mean consciously, but why not, why not, I mean, think of the average person today. They're in fear of this COVID thing. We're, we're so much willing to say, you know what, these individuals do not belong in jail. We've been saying this for a long time. A lot of folks are mentally ill or, or severely addicted, or quite frankly, shouldn't be in jail awaiting trial anyway. It's hard to get anybody's attention until we have this massive pandemic where people are willing to say, you know what, I, I think I'm more willing to do that, judges and, and, and DAs and police chiefs. And I just hope we, I hope we don't make it about this healthcare crisis. We continue the growth and what is the reform, but let's not forget, there's a big issue out there as well for getting access to healthcare for something such as this pandemic that when these people walk out of jails in most communities, it's a long shot for them to get what they need. So I worry about that down the road, but I appreciate being a part of this as well. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and I want to give a, a shout out. There is a federal bill that I think LEAP or the Law Enforcement Action Partnership had a event on before quarantine that would at least allow for people to be um, have the same Medicare coverage while they were incarcerated so they weren't automatically unenrolled, which is a big thing I know sheriffs um, and correctional agencies talk about um, just because of that discontinuity in service. This is a great segue to a couple of the audience questions that we have. We don't have th that much time left, so uh, short and sweet is the name of the game. Um, uh, Brandy asks, when we're thinking about re-examining public safety, have any of the panelists seen promising practices or of jails addressing how to safely transition individuals being released, particularly by ensuring they have a connection to a safe place to quarantine if they can't return home safely? So if you don't mind, I, I will say real quickly, uh, our community, our very first case in our jail that was positive was a homeless person. So I went to the mayor's office and said, look, he does not belong in jail, he's homeless. It's not fair to him or everyone else. So actually our city built uh, a homeless shelter for COVID people uh, just within a week or so. And so that's been helpful because they need a place to go quote quarantine, but also to receive some follow-up care. And so that was a reaction to the crisis, but I'm telling you, it worries me that we're not gonna be able to keep doing that in these communities uh, if you don't have a place to, to offer someone. Yeah. Um, one last question in the last two minutes of the panel. Um, as courts are set to reopen soon, what, what is that going to look like? How, how are you guys planning on, particularly Sheriff Hall or Secretary Tilly, in your, in your previous experience, how, would, how are you going to handle or expecting to kind of prepare for that shift in population? Well I, well, I think we had the, the Chief Justice of California on one of our calls and many others as has been referenced. And I want to thank R Street for what has been a, a great panel before we jump off quickly. But I would say she said there'll be a deluge of cases. She used that terminology. And so I think we all have to kind of hold our breath to see what it looks like. But, but you know, there are Sixth Amendment rights at play here. People um, you know, are, have a right to get to court. Um, they should expect that. But in light of what will be um, uh, again, so many who need that same right exercised. There'll have to be some patience exercised, and I, I think we'll have to prioritize those cases which, which need attention. So as the sheriff has mentioned, those who are awaiting trial in a jail somewhere, those need to be prioritized if they are being detained for public safety reasons, get their case adjudicated as quickly as possible. And I do think civil cases, again, not to, are going to have to take a back seat to a certain extent to some of these others. And I know we're out of time. So again, a lot of other thoughts there, but that's a great question and one which will have to be addressed quickly. Well, thank you everybody from joining the panel today. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact R Street. I will put up quickly our email address on the screen, but otherwise have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.